Wow, good morning, everyone. This is great to see who, who comes to the early service, isn't it? <laughs> and it, see, it seems like there's two primary groups, young people with young children that wake up at 6 in the morning, yeah. <laughs> and then older people that wake up anyway because they went to bed early. <laughs> And so, this is great, having, this, uh, having these two choices. Uh, well, this is like home for us. We, we love it here. And uh, we love Duncan and Kate and Marie and Ash and all of you. It's just a real treat to have been here this week. How many came to the conference this week? Wonderful. How many of you here are visitors hung over from the conference? Good. I hung over, overflowed. <clears throat> well, you you could be you could be yeah the overflow conference, but you could be hung over too, couldn't you? <clears throat> okay. Um, you know, there's there's certain things that you know that I'd like I champion, I suppose. As, as we go along, where I feel like they're getting missed by the body of Christ. Uh, not totally, but somewhat. And uh, one of those things is, is an awareness of the soon return of the Lord Jesus. So I want to encourage all of you to perk up your ears and start listening in on that. And just realize how important that is to Jesus. Because, see, he's not going to return when you think it's right. He's going to return when he thinks it's right. And when the Father says, now. Yeah. All right? So that's, that'll be the highlight of uh, the universe when that day comes. Because it's ushering in so many things. But another one is the fact that this great salvation that we're enjoying and having and talking about is, is understood perhaps in too shallow a way. The implications of what happened at the cross with Jesus is something we need to meditate uh, over and over again about it so we can really get it deep within our spirit. Now see, you can believe superficially and be saved. And your mother and daddy can tell you that you need to be born again and you need to invite Jesus in your heart. And so you do it and, uh, and then carry on without, without really understanding the depth of this thing. And so I want us to just look for a few minutes at the depth of it and turn in your Bibles to John chapter 3 and... I'll read that uh, with you. And uh, it says this. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, that, that was a nice thing for one of the members of the Sanhedrin, the ruling, governing body of the Jewish people, to say to Jesus, don't you think? We know, I know, maybe the others don't know, but I know that you are a man come from God. The signs that you do approve it. No one can do these things like you do unless God is with him. And so what's underneath this question? Because Jesus says something that really seems to be unrelated. Like what's your mission? I think he's wondering, what's your mission? What's the real deal? Why are you really here? What's up with all of this? Because Jesus says, says to this guy, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Just let that sink in a minute. 
Can you imagine him now? Nicodemus, he's well-educated, he's wealthy, he's influential. And he goes, huh? How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, most assuredly. Say that to your friend, most assuredly. In other words, this is really, really true. Get this point. Unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Huh. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. You must be born again. Why? Because see, if you're not born again, then you're not going to see the kingdom of God. Jesus is spelling it out clearly to this guy. But I want us to go a little deeper and say, why is that the case? Why is it true what he's saying? And every time I read those words, I think of John Wesley. Because he was asked, Mr. Wesley, why is it that everywhere you go, you preach pretty much the same sermon? You must be born again. And Wesley said back to him, well, it's because you must be born again. <clears throat> Tell the person next to you, you must be born again. Now the context is we're all here and present in this world right now in the flesh, but you're not going to be that way forever. Uh, because you tend to grow older and then pass off the scene. As I came in this morning, one of the camera ladies said to me, are you really 89? <laughs> I said, no, I'm 78. And she said, ah, oh, okay, I was trying to do the math, but you know. <clears throat> but see, for 78, I'll be 79 at Christmas. And, uh, but after that, you, you know, you can go anytime, can't you? I mean, my, my father died at 76. My mother died at 78. Hey, I beat both of them. Carol, on the other hand, has got longevity in her lineage. You know, her, her father was uh, 94 or 5, and your mother was 98, almost 99. But the point is, they're not here anymore. So where did they go? What happens when you come out of your body and that's the end of you? You ever been with a person when they died? Isn't it funny how we don't like to talk about it? I was with a guy last Wednesday who died in a dentist chair. And he came back, fortunately. <clears throat> But he loved the encounter because it opened up to him a revelation of what's beyond. And so this is where Jesus is taking us. You must be born again because evolution is not true. You're not just the product of chance and, uh, you know, chance, whatever, lightning hit a swamp and... and a tadpole, and then a lizard, and then a monkey, and now you. I mean, that's not what happened, friends. I mean, smart people have bought the most unscientific craziness that you've ever imagined. You are made in the image of God, and you are made for eternity. But there's a problem. Man has rebelled and fallen and gone his own way. And that's the problem. So this now is all about redemption. This is all about God loving you so much that he's doing something about it. 
And as we read on, we'll unpack it even more. <clears throat> Don't marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but can't tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. I love that verse, by the way. Carol says to me, yeah, you're all over the place. You're going here, and then you're going there, and you've got all these things going. And I'll say, honey, the wind blows where it wants to blow. <laughs> Nicodemus answered and said, how can these things be? And Jesus said to him, are you a teacher of Israel and you do not know these things? Wait a minute, you're a teacher, a learned teacher, and you're teaching others in Israel, and you don't know the basics about how you must be born again? Huh. He'd never heard of it before. Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen. And you, you guys, you people, do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? That is such a tantalizing verse of scripture. You mean, Jesus, that all this you must be born again. You, you classify that as earthly things? Yeah, that has to do with you and I here on earth taking care of business here, getting us ready for what's about to come. What if he told you earthly, uh, heavenly things? You can't, can't get your head around this. How are you going to believe earth, the, the heavenly things like Angels and glory and music of heaven and, oh my goodness. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life for God, God the Father, so loved the world, so loved you, so loved your family, your children, so loved the people around you. Just nudge the person next to you, so loves you. Come on, wake up to it. He loves you. <clears throat> That's why this thing is happening. So he gave... As a gift, his only begotten son, that's Jesus, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now listen, he who believes in him is not condemned, but, say but, he who does not believe is condemned already. Why? Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. This is the reason they're condemned. Light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And so all this is... <clears throat> sorting out who wants righteousness, who wants to do things uh, under the authority and love of God, and who would rather have a go doing it their own way. That's, that's, the, that's the deal going on on the earth right now. Yeah. I am so glad my grandfather at a Billy Graham crusade when I was fighting it with everything that was in me, and he leaned over to me and he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, if you're not sure, you better go. 
oh my goodness, that just cut through my stubbornness and rebellion. And as a 14-year-old, I just was the last guy at the altar of 2,000 people that day. Isn't it amazing how you can go from nothing to everything? But see, here, here's the deal. God is perfect in all his ways. Are you okay with that? Are you sure? God is perfect in all his ways, which means every, every time we hurt someone else and there's an injustice that goes on, he wants that put right. And every outstanding debt, he wants that paid. And it's just how he is. That's what it is to be God, the perfect one. And so, he's not going to change who he is to accommodate you. Oh, Lord, can't you just let this slip by this time? I mean, you know, my intentions were good. You're asking me to forfeit my perfection to accommodate your sinfulness. Not a chance. See? And so, here's the dilemma. When we come to the end of our life and we stand before him, we have all of this stuff, accumulated baggage that we've stacked up a whole pile of things where we hurt this one, hurt that one, and slandered the other one, and bad-mouthed the other one, and sinned against that one, and stole from that one, and lied that, about that one. And you show up there, and you have absolutely no way to repay it. See, that's why hell is real. Heaven is for people that have been redeemed and been perfected by the perfection of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's building a kingdom of life and love and joy. That's what that's all about. And if you, if you get disqualified, then it's not for you. Tell the person next to you, hell is real. Make no mistake about it. The, the absolute perfection of God demands it. And so when Jesus says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Uh, what's he talking about? Have you guys read that in the Old Testament? And you think, what? You, the people are, they, they were sinning, they were rebelling, they're doing their own thing. And so all of a sudden, all these snakes come out of nowhere and they're poisonous, they're cobras, they're biting them, and, and they're dying from the venom. And they realize, oh, we need God. Help us, Lord, help us. And Moses prays, Lord, what do we do? And he says, make a bronze snake and put it on a pole and hold it up and tell the people, look and live. And you read that and you're like, what? <laughs> There's two stories that rabbis don't want to discuss with their yeshiva students. And I'm talking about both of them this morning. And that's the first one. What is that saying to people who are in the dark? That God's endorsing some kind of idolatry so that there's power looking at that thing? No, Jesus said, as Moses, the, the Old Testament uh, concluded, nothing said anymore, 400 years. It ends with that unexplained mystery. What's the snake on the pole all about? I don't know. We don't even talk about it because it sounds like idolatry. And here comes Jesus saying, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And I want you to just probe into that uh, illustration just for a moment. Why a snake on a pole, and how can that give life? What do you think? For the sake of time. 
<clears throat> the pole represents the cross. The snake on the pole represents Jesus. What? I thought a snake was a symbol of sin and rebellion. Uh-huh. How does that work? How does that fit? The Bible says he, Christ Jesus, he who knew no sin, the perfect one, he became sin. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. So that was the trait. The perfect one said, I am willing to take your sin and your sin and your sin and your sin and the sin of the whole world. I will take it upon myself and I will pay the price for it. And you need to understand who Jesus is. He's the son of God. What is his life worth? He's worth more than all of us put together. He's worth more than all the angels put together. He's God's only begotten son. Think of what, what, this, what this God of ours is like. He's willing to go to this unbelievable extent to ask his beloved to come down and, all right, have three and a half years of ministry, but then die for these ungrateful people because they are going to turn around, many of them, and they are going to believe. So he dies, and at the last moment, see, he's hanging on that cross six hours from nine in the morning till three in the afternoon. And through the nails in his hands and his feet and the thorns in his brow and the whipping on his back, he's bleeding, bleeding, bleeding. And he's, he's traumatized. He's in shock. He's, he, he, there he is, bleeding to death. So I've asked the Lord, why, why the cross? Why the torture? I mean, why couldn't he just be beheaded even like John the Baptist and get it over with? It's like, no, no. No, I, I wanted him to bleed to death and then die. Why? Because that royal blood was poured out first. That blood was never tainted by sin. That blood that represents his holy life that we celebrate drinking the wine and eating the bread. That's the blood of the Son of God, untainted. Whereas his body, at that last moment, you hear the cry of Jesus. My God, why have you forsaken me? Oh, those haunting words. What happened, friends? Would God forsake his own son at the very last moment? The answer is, yes, he did. Because he who knew no sin became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God in him. And as he became sin, the father had to look away. I cannot fellowship with him now. And he cried out and dismissed his spirit and died. Now it would have been unjust to leave him dead because actually... He didn't do anything wrong. He paid someone else's debt. You know, I'm forever telling the story of a young man who robbed banks and broke into homes. And imagine if he broke into your home and stole your stereo and all your music and all your iPhone and it's all gone, you know. The police caught him. It all went to court and the evidence was heard. The judge said, young man, I find you guilty and I fine you uh, $100,000 war, five years in prison. He said, well, I have no money. I can't pay. Right, five years. But just then, before he smacked the gravel down, gavel down, uh, 
a man stood and said, Your Honor, may I say something? This young man is a friend of mine, and I know that he's truly sorry for all that he's done wrong. So, if the court please, I will pay the fine for him. Do you know the court took the friend's money and released that young man into the custody of his friend? And see, that's exactly what Jesus did for you. And so the bridge that happened, the thing about the cross is it's vertical and it's horizontal. And what happened in that moment when your debt was paid, now the holiness and the righteousness and the perfection of God is satisfied. So now as a loving father, he can reach out to you because that was his motivation all along. God so loved you. He's like, oh, we have to find a way. This is the way. Let's do this. And Jesus agreed. And yet, even in the garden of Gethsemane, he's like, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. There's got to be another way. I don't want to go through with this. Nevertheless, not my will, your will. Let's do it your way because I trust you your way is always perfect. <clears throat> this is the Father's plan to rescue you. What are you worth? You are worth the blood of Jesus, the life of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is different than the blood of Abel, the book of Hebrews says. Abel's blood is crying out for justice and revenge crying out to God from the ground. My brother has murdered me. Do something about it. But it says the blood of Jesus cries better things than the blood of Abel. What's the, what's the blood of Jesus crying? Lord, will you have mercy on that young Duncan Smith? <laughs> I know he's wandering far away, but will you put your hook in him and pull him back in Jesus' name? Ah, that's what the blood of Jesus is crying. Mercy for you and you and you and you and me. Isn't it fantastic, everybody? Can you imagine such a genius plan? And you know, one of the things that irritates me is like uh, uh, liberal theologians in the past have called this kind of stuff butcher shop religion. Because they just have no clue about the holiness and the perfection of God and what it takes to satisfy him so that he can love you because he will not compromise on his perfection. And so we see the sacrifice all through scripture, don't we? Adam and Eve, they sinned. What they do, they disobeyed God, basically. Don't eat of that tree, eat all the others. And then the enemy comes along and says, you won't die. Go on, try it. And they did. And then they realized, oh my gosh, we're naked. What happened? I think the glory lifted off of yeah. them. And then they hear the Lord walking in the cool of the day. And uh, they hide themselves. And he says, Adam, where are you? And so they quickly cover themselves with fig leaves. And here, here we are. And who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree that I told you not to eat? Uh huh. And then he says, you know what? Fig leaves won't do. And the Lord made for them clothes out of skins. skins. How do you get skins? You, an animal dies, an innocent animal. So the innocent dies for the guilty, so the guilty can have a covering. Right there from the beginning. And then you see Noah sacrificing. He gets off the ark. What do they do? They take some of the animals that they'd rescued and they offer them as a sacrifice to God. What's going on? This animal sacrifice is a picture of the one that is to come. And as we get down into Egypt and, and the rescue from Egypt, the final plague 
is having to do with the Passover. And the Lord says, all right, Pharaoh won't let Israel go. That's my firstborn. So I'm going to go get his firstborn and take them away. And the angel of judgment of death passed through the nation that night. And here was the provision. Take a lamb for every household and kill that lamb. Catch the blood in, the, in a basin. Take hyssop weed like a paintbrush and put it on the lintel in the two side posts of the door. Take that blood and make the sign of the cross over the door to your house. And then, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. Because the innocent has died for the guilty in that house, and so they get a pass. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. And so they've been celebrating that for 3,500 years. And they still don't get the understanding. It's unbelievable. And then when Jesus comes on the scene, John the Baptist says, look, there he is, the Lamb of God who's going to take away the sin of the world. There's the real Passover lamb, everybody. That's what all the type and symbolism is all pointing to right there. There he is. His name is Jesus. And it comes to the cross. I'm, I'm going over it and over it because I want you to appreciate what it costs heaven to redeem you. <clears throat> Did you ever read the story of Abraham and Isaac? Everybody that has little children shudders reading that story. Oh my goodness. Abraham's 99 years old and Sarah's 89 years old and the Lord comes to him and says, you're going to have a son from Sarah. And they both laughed. Oh, that's hilarious. How many of you would laugh if you were 89 years old and somebody said, you're going to have a baby? From a 99-year-old man. Yeah, from a 99-year-old man. <laughs> If, if that happens, you also can call the child laughter, okay? Because that's what Isaac means. And so, Abraham's 100, Sarah's 90, Isaac is born. And he's lovely, and he's this little boy growing up, and, and, and just so amazing. And they loved him with all of their heart. And then one day when he's about 12 or 13 or whatever, the Lord comes back and says, Abraham, I want you to take your son, Isaac, who you love, and go to one of the mountains of Moriah that I will show you and offer him there as a burnt sacrifice unto me. I can't imagine it. It's like, what? See, that's the other portion that the rabbis won't talk to their yeshiva students about. Because now it sounds like human sacrifice. And they, they just don't have an answer, an explanation. But I want to ask you, what's going on here? And people say, well, God's like that. You know, he gives you something. And then he wants to see, okay, do you love that more than me? Uh, I want it back now. That's not what's going on. So he sets off <clears throat> with Isaac, a couple of servants, away they go. And uh, how many think he told Sarah? <laughs> what did he say to her? Honey, we're going camping for a few days. And no one did. <laughs> We'll be back, I hope. <laughs> and off they go. And here's the amazing thing. Moriah is the ridge of, of, 
uh, mountain ridge or hills through the city of Jerusalem. And uh, <clears throat> Golgotha, or uh, yeah, is, prob is the highest peak on that ridge and is probably the mountain they went up. And so now they're going up the mountain. Isaac's got the wood on his back. Abraham's got the torch and fire in his hand. And Isaac's like, what are we doing? Like, what's going on? Father, we have the wood, we have the fire, we have the knife. Where's the lamb? Oh. Interesting answer in Hebrew. He says, God will provide himself a lamb. Or God himself will be the provided lamb, depending on how you translate that. And they go up the mountain. And here's the amazing thing. They build the altar together. They put the wood on together. And then Isaac somehow ends up on the altar. I guess Abraham said, son, I want you to get up on the altar. Who do you think could run the fastest? A 14-year-old or a 114-year-old? But Isaac did it. Why? Because he trusted his father. He is this perfect type of Jesus. And he gets up on the altar. And Abraham is about to do it. And he hears this voice, stop. I wanted to see if you would really go through with it. And see, right there, we as Christians, we struggle as well. And we're like, what a horrible, cruel task to do. If that's what you're like, I don't like you. And people draw wrong conclusions. So I want to ask you, what's going on here? Here's my answer. God wants to know. Is there a man anywhere who's willing to do what I'm about to do with my son? I'm not going to require it of him, but I just want to know, is there one anywhere? And that man was Abraham. And that's why the Lord says, he's my friend. I can track with this guy. This, this is a very loving, unselfish person. And he's got, the, he's got the stuff. He really has. And so, stop. There's a lamb caught in a thicket. Go get it. And the substitutionary death, see, Isaac comes off the altar, the lamb goes on, and the lamb dies instead of Isaac. And it completes this incredible prophetic type of what it took to rescue you and me. And if that were not enough, when Jesus is about to go to the cross, he's like, oh, and one more thing. Remember Steve Jobs? Oh, one more thing. One more thing. I want him whipped. What? Why add insult to injury? The cross is the most horrible, excruciating death ever devised by the demented minds of men. And you're going to whip him first? Yeah. Why? Because, yeah, he's wounded for our transgressions. He's bruised for our iniquities. And the, and the punishment of our peace is upon him. But by his stripes, we are healed. So he carries our sicknesses and bore our diseases. And so on the way to the cross, I'm going to pay for your healing in the flesh, in the here and now. So your healing's paid for already. And your sin is paid for already. And all you have to do now is believe. Nothing to do except believe that it's all been done. What an incredible good news story. You see, we've got people running all around the world looking for love in all the wrong places. And they're looking in sex, drugs, rock and roll, and every thing of debauchery that you could possibly imagine. And they don't know 
that the best party of all is right here in the Father's house. And not only that, but that's what gets you ready for eternity. Because see, friends, this thing is going somewhere. It's not just about you getting saved and then that's the end of it. We all go to heaven. No. There is a wedding coming. This is just the, the starting point that we're talking about here. This is, you must be born again because you've got to get that start. But you go from there, if you can believe it, to be the bride of Christ. It's like so over the top, you can't, you can't even imagine. You know, I just for fun one day, I sat down, I said, Lord, help my imagination. I just want to run wild here. But is there any way that I could improve on the gospel message uh, in its totality? Is there any way that I could say, oh, I wish you'd have thought of this, you know, because that would have been a nice touch right there. I could not think of one thing that he, would, that he could have done to make it even more perfect. Can you? Listen, friends. This is not only worth dying for, this is worth living for. And then when he came along and added in 94 this lavish outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and Carol and I were giddy beside ourselves with what God was doing, we're like, we're living the dream, baby. And then, if that is not enough, the Father himself loves you. And they, the three of them, want to come and make their home in you. I better stop because it's just too mind-blowing. Let's all stand. If you're here and you're thinking, you know what, John, I think my relationship with Jesus is just too shallow. I, I didn't know the extent of, of what, it, what it costs to redeem me. I, I've not really thought about it in depth before. And so if you're here and you have cooled off or you've fallen away or you got compromised in life, you know, people fall away. It's crazy. I fell away for a while in high school. Carol never did. She got saved and just never looked back. But some of us get stupid. <laughs> and uh, you know that the pressures of life will cause you to compromise and and you, you get with friends, and you get with this, you get with that. Sometimes it's university, and they talk nonsense to you, and you believe it. It's not all nonsense, but the stuff about God is. And, uh, and, and so, or a career, or a relationship, or something, people fall away. Or maybe, you know, you just got trapped. You know, that pornography kept coming to you over your computer, and next thing you know, you were... You had a glance, and then a long glance, and then pretty soon you're hooked, and now what? And all that kind of stuff gets in the way, and will, it's trying to strip you of your salvation so that heaven does not become your home at the end of your life. And there's only one way, friends, through Jesus. So if you know that your heart's grown cold towards him, or if you got separated from him, or maybe you're here this morning with a friend or whatever, and you have never surrendered your life to the Savior who loves you. I want us to just bow our heads and get quiet for a minute and ask him, Lord, do I need to invite you back into my heart? If I walked away from you, do I need to come home? Lord Jesus, have I ever fully surrendered to you? I want to live a life of peace knowing 
that my past is taken care of and my eternity is sure and my life here and now is watched over by a loving Savior who loves me. If you want Jesus in your heart and you've been away from him, I'm not talking to the bulk of you that are that are Christian and, and secure in that. But if you're here and you know that you need to invite Jesus to be your Lord and Savior and King, I want you to take a moment right now and just say to him under your breath, Jesus, I want you in my heart and in my life. And thank you for going through all that trouble to rescue me. And mean it. Because see, that's what kicks it in when you're sincere and you really mean it. A lot of people say the words hoping there's some kind of magic in the words, but no, it's, it's your heart getting honest and truthful with the God of truth and perfect love. Now, if you just told him that, I want you unashamedly to raise your hand and hold it up and wave it at me so I can see it. I just told Jesus I want him back in my life. Unashamedly, please, wave. Thank you over there. Anyone else? Over there. God bless you. I hope I didn't miss anyone. God bless you. Listen, if you raised your hand just now and you meant it, I'm going to ask you to take another step. Step into the nearest aisle and quickly come down here so I can pray with you. Because we want to seal the deal right now. So come on. This would be the greatest day of your life. I'm telling you. The Bible says, the angels rejoice. Come on, sweetie. Come on. God bless you. Lean over to your friend and do like my grandfather did. Say, hey, should you be down at the front with these others? <laughs> Come on close. God bless you, young man. I'd like us all to say this prayer just before we close. You guys as a prayer of remembrance, but all of you that came up, I want you to say this and mean it with everything that's within you. Is that okay? Just a short prayer that says, Lord, I'm here, I'm sorry, uh, come into my heart, stuff like that, all right? But say it out loud fervently and mean it totally, all right? Here we go. Dear Lord Jesus, come on, all you, and this is a prayer of remembrance for you. Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you this morning and I admit that I have sinned I've done many wrong things and others have done wrong things to me and I need a savior. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Wash me clean from all my sins. I'm so sorry for them all and I forgive those who have sinned against me and hurt me. Thank you for forgiving me and thank you for the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ my Lord Father I thank you for them and I ask that your powerful love will come upon them right now and just bless these dear friends and I want to encourage all of you just come running back to him. He receives you with open arms. And he wants to heal up your little achy, breaky heart. And make you strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And help you to be a part of the solution of rescuing a fallen world in America, in Europe, South America, all over the place. 
the whole world. Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. Thank you for this little boy here who is just so touched right now. Pour in your love to him, Lord Jesus. Let him know he's loved, 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 loved. Look up here, friends, and say it with me. Wow, something's just happened. I choose to believe it. Because that's it. Just believe. And it all kicks in. Isn't it amazing? Nothing to do. Don't go home, try to sort yourself out and all that. Just believe it. And say, I'm with you, Jesus. I'm walking with you. Anybody here doing this for the very first time? Yes, yes, come on, you man. God bless you. Let's give them a great big welcome to the family of God. Welcome, 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 welcome.